Hello and welcome to another video from Double Rail. This is a quick introductory video to show you the different options you have for doing computer control on your model railway layout. So in this video, what we're going to do is take a look at the different options that are available, where you might use one board over another, and where we're using them in our layout. Now, this is the first video in a series, uh, so in the next couple of videos in this series, you'll see us teaching you how to uh, load software onto the different modules and how to put together the different modules for different projects. Now this is part of our double rail system. Uh, you can find the demo video I did in a uh, link here. And basically what it is, it's a means of controlling your layout via your phone or tablet or using a browser on your computer. Um, so hopefully you guys will find this useful. And uh, now the way we've designed the double rail system, uh, you can actually use different components of it. So if you just want the signaling component and you want to use a Z21 uh, for your computer control, you can do that. If you want to use your ECOS or your um, or your, your Bachman Dynamis um, with our level crossing or, or signaling or train detection module, you, you can do that as well. Um, if you've got a DC system and you want to use our digital DC platform and use different modules, you can do that. So you can sort of pick and choose which building blocks you want to use. Um, so we're going to have more on that in upcoming videos. So if you haven't subscribed, um, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and, and ring the bell and you'll get uh, notified when we do that. So what we're going to do today, like I said, is introduce you guys to different modules. All right. So before I get started showing you all the different types of boards, one thing I wanted to point out was that all of these boards, with the exception of the one here in the corner, um, can actually be programmed using the Arduino IDE. And so the Arduino IDE is kind of a software package that you can use for programming the Arduinos, uh, but it has some extra built-in modules, so you can load those modules and can control the other boards as well. So um, as part of the video series that we'll be doing, uh, we'll show you how to load the software that you can download from us onto each of these different boards um, as we progress through the project. So just want to point that out, if, you, if you've got a computer, you might want to go check out the Arduino IDE. Um, you just various different options. There's MicroPython and some other things that you can use for these other boards. Um, but we'll be using the Arduino IDE just because it's easier to use. All right, so let's start off with the modules you're probably most familiar with, with your, which are the Arduinos. Um, so this is probably the most common module you'll see. It's an Arduino Uno. Um, this is a Chinese version of it. Um, now, the Arduino is a open source hardware platform, so you'll see other companies will have uh, produced them. However, the um, Arduino branded ones, um, which have the Arduino logo and typically have this kind of slick white uh, silk screening on the back of the boards, um, these are ones that are actually officially produced by the project. And so if you want to contribute back, um, you know, to help fund that project, buying their boards is a good option. However, if you're on a budget crunch or you need a lot of modules, and what I typically will do is I will buy one or two of the Arduino branded ones, and then um, I will buy a couple of the, the Chinese off brand ones as well, mainly because um, you know it can get pretty expensive if you have a large layout. So the one thing with the Arduinos is that they have new uh, connectivity. And what that basically means is they don't have any Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Uh, you can actually add connectivity to it through a couple of things called a shield. Uh, this one here is an Arduino Ethernet shield, and basically it gives Ethernet um, network access to the Arduino, and it's quite easy to do. You just basically uh, piggyback the shield um, on top of the board, and they kind of click together like so, and you end up with kind of a piggybacked uh, version of it. Now, one thing I will tell you is that when you, when you use this, you typically get extra functionality. So here you can see we got an SD card slot, as well as the um, as the Ethernet port, but you will have limited access uh, to the pins, and so uh, obviously it's using some of the pins for the connectivity back and forth, and um, it should be relatively easy to disconnect them as well. They just pull apart like so. Um, you just want to make sure you don't bend anything, and so that's one way to get. Uh, internet access onto them. Now, so why would you use a module that doesn't have built-in internet access? Well, one of the advantages with the uh, Arduino is they're really designed for one or two specific tasks, and they do that task very well. So 
this is an Arduino Mega, and the difference between the different modules is basically the number of analog pins, the number of digital pins, and the number of uh, pulse width modulation uh, pins that you get. And so what, why this is important is, for example, I did a video a while back on how to control relay boards, um, and the relay boards are used to like throw points and point motors and so on. And I'll put a link to the video um, up here. Um, but basically, um, the, the number of pins allow you to control one board might control, you know, like 20 points or, or, or 30 points, depending on what you're trying to do. And so it can help lower the cost and it will do those things very specialized. So you basically will communicate to the board hey, throw point number three, it'll throw point number three by controlling the relay board. And so it does these things very, very well. It also has a bit more robust power output, uh, which is down here. So if you're doing something, like I said, like a relay board, it might make more sense to, to use an Arduino uh, rather than more, the more delicate uh, ESP modules that I'll show you in a minute. Um, so, one of the advantages with the Arduino is it comes in various different form factors, so you can kind of offset your costs depending on your application. If you've got a very centralized, complex set of points, uh, you might use something like an Arduino Mega. You'll use one board and it'll control all your points that are close together. Um, if you've got a small station, and uh, maybe it's only got two or three sets of points, uh, you won't need as many outputs, so you might not want to use a, a 40 or $50 uh, board. Instead, you might use something like the Leonardo that has you know, a smaller number of outputs and, and inputs. Um, likewise, if you've got maybe a branch line or a maybe just a, a small junction or even just a, a siding, uh, you might use something like the Nano. Now, the thing to realize is all these different boards, whether it's the Uno, the, or the Leonardo, the Mega, the um, Nano, or one of the other boards that they sell, um, these boards are basically the same thing. They, you just have different number of input and outputs. Um, so what you really need to do is look at what you're trying to do and then pick the best board um, to control it. All right, so I just showed you the um, Arduino boards. And one of the problems with the Arduino boards is they actually don't have any connectivity, right? So you can like use the shield like I showed you, um, but you're still having extra wiring and the shield adds a considerable amount of cost to it. I believe these are about $30, $40. Um, and so a better option is the ESP8266. Now, the ESP8266 is a low cost um, Wi Fi enabled module. And I believe you can buy three of these for like $10. Um, so they're really, really cheap. Um, now, you first thing you'll notice is they don't have as many pins. Um, I do have, they come in different shapes and sizes. So this one has a built-in LCD display and a few more pins than this one. Um, but basically, uh, what you can do with them is you can put a little bit of code on them. Um, they'll do connectivity to your Wi-Fi network and they can actually act as a Wi-Fi access point, I believe. And uh, you can also put things like a web server on them. And so one of the things you probably saw with the demo that I did um, of the double rail system is we use the kind of more modern version of these um, to to provide the web server and, and interact and so on. So you can use this module kind of in unison with one of these to give this Wi-Fi access as well as to maybe control multiple boards like this um, from a single module. So what you might have is you might have an Arduino, maybe an Arduino Uno that's controlling your points and maybe controlling your signaling. And you might have two or three of these and you can connect them to this and then use this to give yourself web access or API access to control this from your tablet or from your phone or whatnot. Um, and a lot of the code that we'll be doing will actually be using that kind of thing. So for example, we're using uh, the Arduino Mega for point control, and then we'll be using an A266 to basically provide access into that. So we tell the A266 via the phone to throw point number three, it sends a signal to the Arduino and it throws point number three. And of course we've written all the code for that for you already. And uh, so you just have to download it, load it onto the two boards and off you go. So one of the interesting things about the A266 um, is that it's 160 megahertz um, and it does um, 2.4 gigahertz, um, 802.11n, B and G. So it's pretty, 
pretty robust little module and these are also used for things like internet of things or smart homes and so on and um, so a lot of the devices you might have like a smart light bulb or a smart fridge and they typically have a module like this um, integrated into them and that's how they provide the, the Wi-Fi control. So you can use these things for controlling level crossings, for controlling uh, relay boards. Um, in fact, we use them directly with a smaller relay board to control you know, one set of points in certain parts of the layout where it doesn't make any sense to throw in an Arduino or anything like that. Uh, so they're a very robust board. Um, now these things are quite old, which is why they're cheap. Uh, I believe they're a couple of years old. Uh, and so like I said, you can get packs of these uh, for just a couple of dollars. Um, now they have a new version out called an ESP32-S2. Um, it's single core, which means it only has one processor core, um, but it can do a lot more uh, than this particular board. I believe it runs at 240 megahertz, and um, they're a new board that's coming out. So once they become more widely available, um, we'll pick up a few and we'll show you how to use them in the project and so on. All right, so the next module we're looking at is an ESP32. So the ESP32 is actually one of my favorite modules. Uh, it's pretty pretty slick. Um, they come in different types, uh, so you kind of have to look at the product code a little carefully. And um, they're all dual core, um, which means they basically they have uh, two microprocessors inside the one package, uh, which is kind of cool because it means you can control them independently. Um, now, they use one of the microprocessors to do the Wi-Fi as well as the Bluetooth, um, but you can also run your own software on that particular core as well. Uh, so some of the stuff that you'll see with some of our projects, and uh, we actually leverage this uh, so that the chip can actually do two things at once, basically, and it makes it a lot easier to do things like train detection, um, controlling different uh, lights and, and so on. And we'll show you that in, in an upcoming video. So similarly to the ESP8266, uh, um, they have a, a set number of GPIO pins. Uh, this particular module actually has, I think about 11 or 12 uh, GPIO pins that you can use. Uh, it also has a kind of a cool couple of features. It's got a built-in hall sensor uh, so it can detect things like magnetic fields. Um, it also has capacitive touch sensors. So some of the pins uh, you can wire up and program and basically you can use it for, for capacitive touch. Um, and if you're not sure what capacitive touch is, I mean, it can detect you know anything that can, can conduct electricity, uh, like your finger, uh, certain types of metals and so on. Uh, you can actually use it to, um, to, to detect things. So it's kind of cool. Um, now you can use, as you saw in my previous video, uh, again, I'll, I'll link it up there with the demo. Um, you can use this to control things like um, kind of external driver boards, uh, which we use to control, do kind of DC computer control. Um, they, like I said, they have built-in Wi-Fi as well, just like the uh, ESP8266. Um, they range, if you look at the product number, in speed from 160 megahertz to 240 megahertz and the other thing that they can do um, is over the air updating which means once you load software onto this uh, you can actually upload new software to it during Wi-Fi uh, so what we typically do here on the layout is we'll install a module get the software running on it and then go install it on the layout and then we can actually do the update to it um, via the Wi-Fi and not have to worry about trying to lug a computer over to wherever it's at to, to do the update, which is very handy. Now you can do the update via the air uh, using the 8266 module, um, but it's a little slower and has a couple of issues sometimes. But the 82, sorry, the ESP32 uh, module is a really robust module and these things cost about four to six dollars a piece. So they're dirt cheap compared to the Arduino. So the last board we're taking a look at is the Raspberry Pi. Now this is a Raspberry Pi uh, 3 Model B Plus. Uh, they have a newer version which is a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, the Raspberry Pi 4 comes in 1, 2 and 4 gig versions I believe. Um, and, uh, they're not too expensive so I would recommend uh, picking up the Raspberry Pi, Pi 4, probably the 2 gig version if you're looking for it. Um, but these are basically a miniature computer. Um, so you can see here they have an SD card slot on the back, which you can uh, 
put your SD card in and they basically boot Linux. Um, there's a special version of Linux called Raspbian and uh, you can use your computer to load it onto an SD card, drop the SD card in, um, plug your TV into the HDMI, plug your USB keyboard into the USB port, power it up and you've got yourself a little computer. And the cool thing with this is it's kind of a cross between the Arduino and the ESP32 in that you've got um, your computer control, you've got your Wi-Fi, your Ethernet, um, but it also has these GPIO pins so you can still do the similar type of stuff that you could do with the Arduino controlling electronics and so on. Um, these are a little bit more expensive. Like I said, they're about the um, Raspberry Pi typically runs about $30 to $40. Um, and the Raspberry Pi 4 has a couple of different versions. Um, now what we're using this for on the layout is this is actually the board we use um, for doing the centralized control. Um, so we have a Raspberry Pi 4, a 2 gig and a 4 gig version that we kind of interchange. And these are basically the brains of our layout. Um, the cool thing with these is you can control yeah, with the HDMI ports. Uh, you can actually uh, plug touch screens into them. Uh, so you can use these as the basis for maybe an ECOS type controller. Um, it's, so there's lots of really cool things that you can do with these. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we've actually attached a couple of different uh, touch screens to it and are using it as an interface uh, to control the layout um, in certain locations. Uh, you can attach displays to it. It's got a ribbon display as well as the HDMI here. Um, so there's lots of, lots of possibilities that you can use these for. Um, on the layout, we're using this as a centralized control. Um, we actually have put a web server on it and um, can offload code to the different modules. So for example, uh, what I will do is when I want to plug a new ESP module into my layout, I will wire up the ESP module on a breadboard, plug it into the USB port on the Raspberry Pi, go to a web page on the Raspberry Pi, tell it to go and load new software onto this, or maybe I want it to be a signal controller, it'll go and load that software onto it and the configuration onto it, and then I can go put it on the layout. Um, so as you can see, going forward, we're gonna be using uh, Raspberry Pi as a kind of centralized control. And um, we have all the software for doing the centralized control all automated, so you basically download Raspbian through a script onto the Raspberry Pi, and off you go, it handles the Wi-Fi and everything for it. And the coolest thing is our software will also allow you to connect these directly to, to the Raspberry Pi via Wi-Fi. And it's kind of like an, an enclosed system um, that will work out of the box. So lots of cool stuff uh, going forward with that. So like I promised, I was going to explain to you um, the kind of differences between the boards. So basically, the ESP32s have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 160 to 240 megahertz they're faster and uh, more powerful than the arduinos but they have less um, digital outputs and they have no analog outputs the esp8266 they're a cut down version or an older version of the esp32 they only have one processor core they do run at 160 megahertz just like uh, the lower end versions of the esp32 they have Wi-Fi, but they do not typically have Bluetooth unless you get a specialized module. And just like the ESP32s, they have less digital input outputs and they have no analog input outputs that you can, um, unlike the Arduinos. The Arduinos are a lot slower. They're um, 16 megahertz. They have a lot more digital input and outputs. They have dedicated analog input and outputs, and they come in various different sizes depending on your project and they can be extended. Uh, you can add internet access to them um, via modules to do ethernet, or you can even use the e ESP8266s um, to give them Wi-Fi control. And then finally, we have the Raspberry Pi, which is basically a full-blown uh, computer uh, with the ability to control uh, some input and outputs as well. So for what we're doing here at WRL, uh, we're using the Raspberry Pi as a centralized controller that we control everything else from. And we upload and download the software to all the other modules from the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you don't have to do that. You can load the modules independently with your computer. Uh, it's totally up to you what you're doing. Um, but this is all part of our open source system. So the code for that to make the Raspberry Pi do all of that and will be available to people to download and so on. 
the um, A266 modules are cheaper than the ESP32s and so we typically will use these where we don't need to use an ESP32. Uh, so for example, if I'm controlling a single set of points, I might use an A266 with a single relay board and um, maybe I want to control the signals from it as well. And so this has enough input and outputs to do that. And so for a siding or something like that, these are good. Uh, you can also use a couple of them and um, have them synchronized through the Raspberry Pi. So it's pretty pretty straightforward. If I'm doing things like um, maybe train detection and I want it to be a little bit faster, um, I would use one of these modules as well. Um, for the ESP32s, I typically use them in more specialized applications. So for example, if I want to control several signals, if I've got a complex junction or the current project I'm currently working on, which is level crossing lights, um, I'm actually using the two cores. So one core controls one of the LEDs uh, in, the, in the blinking back and forth between the two red uh, lights. And then the other one uses the other one. So I can always guarantee that um, using different programming techniques that there will only be one LED on at a time, so you won't get the two LEDs on by mistake in the programming. Uh, the ESP32 is also pretty quick, um, and can, like I said, with a dual core, you can do some kind of slick stuff. Uh, another thing that we're doing is we're actually using um, the ESP32 in a different form factor, as well as the A266 in a different form factor, and we're currently experimenting with these to actually replace DCC chips in the train. Uh, so we'll actually have these inside the locomotive doing various cool stuff. So we've got lots of cool projects for like that going on. And um, finally, we'll use the Arduino boards where we need a lot of digital in and analog input and outputs. So for example, if I'm doing something that requires maybe I'm using a microwave sensor or a light emitting diode, um, where I'm using it to control maybe a couple of lights in a few dozen buildings. It doesn't make any sense to use an ESP32 module that can maybe only control one or two lights. Um, when I can use a Leonardo to control maybe 20 or something like the Mega that could control a couple of hundred. So it, it, there's different various options. Now, having said that, you can actually extend these with different modules. And in some places it might be cheaper to use like a, 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 a way to extend those modules um, with the ESP32 than it is to uh, use a Leonardo or an Uno. And as we go through the different modules that we're producing, um, you'll see um, where it makes sense to use one over the other. But like I said, this is just kind of a brief kind of introductory video to different options that are available. Uh, in terms of loading software onto them, um, this is done by SD card. So with the Raspberry Pi, uh, like I said, you load um, the ESP or you load the SD card with um, Raspbian, which is a, a Linux platform. So you would take a USB or sorry, a SD card reader, a USB based one, plug it into your laptop or your PC, and you would load the software onto it. And then you take the SD card out, plug it in here, plug your screen, plug your keyboard, and power this thing up. Now you can run these headless, so you can load software on it and have it come up automatically with the web interface. That's actually what we're doing. Uh, with the um, double rail system. And so the code for that will be available in, in a couple of days, I think, um, on our GitHub channel. Um, if you're a uh, one of our subscribers, uh, paid subscribers to our early access program, you already have uh, the code for doing that. Um, let's see what else we got. Oh, loading software. So loading software onto um, the Arduinos is pretty straightforward. Uh, you would use a USB, this is like a printer USB connection. Um, this would be a um, micro, I think it's a micro, micro USB uh, connection. And I think some of them have, yeah, this one has a mini uh, USB. I think I may have got this mixed up, but anyway, um, they have different USB connections. You basically plug the USB connector into your computer, load up the Arduino IDE, download the software to it unplug it from your computer, plug it into a power supply, whether it's this way or through the USB, and then it does its one little task over and over and over again. Um, in terms of the ESP32 and the, ES and the ESP8266, uh, these modules, you load the software initially via USB from your computer. You go deploy them wherever you want on your layout, 
and then with our code uh, you can actually use the over the air update um, to update them via Wi-Fi so you basically point your web browser at it tell it to pull um, the software module actually we have it set up to pull it off the uh, Raspberry Pi and it just goes about and updates it so what, you, what you're going to ultimately be able to do is go to a web interface on this tell it hey I want to upload uh, the latest software to signal number five it will go and know that signal number five is this particular module and it will connect to it via Wi-Fi and upload the new code to it and, and off you go and um, the other thing that the we have our software doing and um, with the Raspberry Pi we're currently testing it's actually um, health check uh, the different modules so it will go and it will make sure that you know you don't have a point half thrown and that it can still talk to it and it's still getting data from it and so on and the coolest thing is we can use and um, because it's all web based uh, we can use existing web based technology to go and kind of pull data from it and, and so on so it's um, pretty easy to do all right so that's it for today's video i uh, hope you guys found this useful and if you've lasted this long then uh, good on you um, and what we're going to do in the next video is show you how to use uh, one of our projects and uh, to to utilize one of those modules now the cool thing with our um, projects is that you can just buy the one module so if you want to control level crossing with it um, you can buy this um, one ESP32 module load our level crossing software onto it from your computer and only use that you don't need to have the Raspberry Pi or the other stuff if that's all you want to use it for but if you want to do the whole full-blown system uh, we'll be showing you how to do that as well all right, so um, we're going to wrap it up there. Hope you guys found it useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the comments below. Um, we will have an article up on the uk website uh, that might have some additional information on this as well over the next couple of days. And when that comes out, we'll, we'll let you guys found this video useful. And until next time.